Albert Einstein, that incredible genius, discovered that there's a relationship between mass and energy. The fact that mass is nothing more than super concentrated energy. Mass times the speed of light squared, very big number, will give you the amount of energy contained in that mass. However, there were implications that were left to another to discover. Lee's Meitner realized you could use this equation to produce energy. If you were to take some mass and somehow destroy it, yeah, I know, it sounds crazy. It's against the entire law of conservation of mass. But if you could somehow destroy mass, that mass would be converted into energy using E equals mc squared. It only takes a tiny bit of mass to be converted into a massive amount of energy. And that's what happens in nuclear changes. Nuclear changes on a very small scale disobey the law of conservation of mass and energy. Instead of mass being conserved and energy being conserved, a tiny bit of mass is converted into a massive amount of energy, energy that we use in nuclear power plants. In nuclear fission, which is how our energy is made in nuclear power plants, we take a nucleus of uranium-235. Actually, we take a whole lot of nuclei of uranium-235. They're contained in the fuel rod. Now, most uranium is uranium-238. You have to enrich the fuel in order to get rid of some of that uranium-238 and have a high enough concentration of uranium-235 to undergo fission. You need a minimum of 3% uranium-235 in order for fission to take place. It's called the critical mass, the minimum amount you need to sustain a chain reaction that sustains itself. If you take that uranium-235 in the fuel rod and you hit it with slow-moving neutrons, the uranium-235 will absorb that neutron, become unstable, and split into two smaller nuclei, krypton and barium on average, although it's not always these two. Notice that their mass is smaller than the mass of the original uranium. And if you add up their atomic numbers, they're always going to come out to be 92. Also, on average, three neutrons are shot out. Now, these neutrons are moving incredibly fast. This process converts tiny amounts of mass, so little that it doesn't even show up in the ones place. You've got to go down to the hundreds and thousandths place for this missing mass to show up. But that tiny bit of mass times the speed of light squared, gives you monster amounts of energy to play with. Now, the neutrons are coming out fast. In order to split uraniums, they've got to be slow. So, in between the fuel rods, you have a material that can slow those neutrons down. This material is called the moderator. Now, it's generally made of water. Water can actually slow down neutrons without stopping them. Now, as this reaction takes place, it goes faster and faster and faster and faster and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And if you don't watch it, it's going to get so hot, your uranium is going to actually melt. And it melts so hot, it'll melt right down through the reactor core, which is what happened in Chernobyl. So, in order to prevent this from happening, if we can somehow control the number of neutrons that are hitting the uraniums, we can make the reaction go faster or slower. Is it getting too hot for you? Cut off some of the neutrons using what are called control rods. Is it slowing down too much? Remove the control rods and let more neutrons fly past. Control rods are made of specially treated steel. Why steel? Because iron, the main component of steel, is the most stable nucleus there is, iron 56, and it can absorb neutrons without becoming radioactive itself. So iron 56 is an excellent absorber of neutrons and they put stuff like boron and cadmium into it to enhance it, to strengthen it, raise its melting point, and so on. So here's your basic reactor core diagram. Your fuel rods containing your minimum 3% uranium-235 are immersed in a moderator, usually water, and control rods are allowed to move up and down. Right now they're all the way down, so neutrons can't fly around. If you raise them up, then the neutrons will be free to fly around. You want to make the reaction go faster? Move up the control rods. You want to make the reaction go slower? Lower them down. You want to stop it for some reason? Jump them all the way down to the bottom. And then the reaction will stop. Fuel rods are good on average for about six years. And every two years, they rotate them. The ones on the outside, they move to the inside. The ones on the inside, they move to the middle. And they rotate them every two years. So the fuel rods, which are, the fuel pellets are about that big. And there's a whole lot of them in the rods. Each fuel rod is good for about six years. 
The reactor core generates enough heat to heat up water in a pressurized chamber to heat up water in a less pressurized chamber to get it to boil. This boiling water turns into steam. This steam turns fan blades in a turbine. The turbine is connected to a generator which creates electricity. The steam then recondenses with water coming in from a lake or a stream and that water is pumped back in to be reboiled and the whole system cycles through again. This is a three water loop pressurized water reactor. Not only can nuclear power plants provide electricity for your home, and quite a bit of our electricity is produced by nuclear power, but also nuclear submarines and nuclear aircraft carriers are powered by nuclear power. Some countries that don't have abundant coal, natural gas, or oil resources, I'm talking about countries like Japan and France, rely almost exclusively on nuclear power to generate their electricity. Nuclear power is very safe as long as your plant is built properly, as long as everything is maintained, and everybody is trained and knows how to handle emergency situations. The other way we can generate energy with nuclear reactions is through nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the process that takes place that has powered the sun for the last four and a half billion years at least, and has powered every star since the beginning of our universe over 13 billion years ago. What happens is hydrogen combines to form helium. And when that happens, an insane amount of energy is produced because a tiny bit of mass is destroyed. Now, the total mass of the hydrogens that are colliding, 5.12015 AMUs. The helium and the neutron that are formed have a total mass of 5.011265 AMUs. Not enough to show up in the ones place, but enough to show up in the tenths place. And that tenth of an AMU, if you've got enough of these nuclei, multiply that by the speed of light squared, you get thousands of times more energy than you get out of fission in a fusion reaction. This is how the sun can get power. Hydrogen is turned into helium. Now, nuclei, as you know, contain protons. They're positively charged. So if you're trying to get two positively charged things to come together, you have to overcome their mutual repelling force. Much like if you were trying to overcome the repelling force of two magnets with their north poles facing each other. Ugh. Okay, that's a lot of force to overcome. So you can't make nuclear fusion happen unless you've got extremely high temperatures to get those nuclei to hit each other really, really hard. You need temperatures of millions of degrees, which is why we've never been able to create sustainable fusion here on Earth. In the sun, it's not a problem. Fusion takes place at very high pressures at the sun's core. But the sun is almost a million miles across. We don't have anything that big. So we have to heat it up even more since we can't generate those high pressures. We have not been able to generate a self-sustaining nuclear fusion reactor. We've, we've been able to have, make fusion happen, but not be able to sustain it, not be able to give out more energy than it takes to make it work. Nuclear bombs, thermonuclear hydrogen bombs, rely on an uncontrolled fusion reaction. You've got the hydrogen fuel in the middle. You've got a fission reactor around it so that when the fission reactor goes off, it creates enough pressure to fuse the hydrogen nuclei together. Now, I'm going to be very clear about this. You are not making a molecule. You are not chemically bonding the hydrogens together because hydrogen and hydrogen would make H2. No, you're turning hydrogens into a totally new element. You're fusing the nuclei together, and that's why it's called nuclear fusion. This device is called a tokamak. It's a device that makes use of electromagnetic fields to contain hydrogen plasmas and to focus them enough so that they undergo fusion. But again, it takes more energy to get fusion to happen than we get out of it at the current time. Now, they've been telling us for the last 60 years, fusion power is just 20 years away. Well, they keep saying that. They're, I don't know if they're saying it anymore, but if we can somehow figure out a way to make fusion power work for us, we will have solved pretty much all of our energy problems. This is the ultimate source of energy.